Hey y'all, Carolina Tony here, and we are at the North Carolina State Museum. We're gonna check this place out. Right after this station. Identification. We're at the State Museum and we're going to look around. Well, this first exhibit that I came on was is talking about social order. And it's a subject that I found very interesting and I have studied it in depth probably for the last 30, 40 years. What a lot of people don't know is when they talk about the South, they always think that everybody was rich plantation owners. But studying my own family tree, that's not true by no means. There were also poor white people that worked the fields, that rented land, such as my great-great-grandfather. He worked right along beside slaves. American Indians, free blacks, poor whites, and people with mixed heritage, they didn't really fit into any category and they were subject to different types of discrimination such as today there is a social order among people whether people want to admit it or not not everybody fits in to everywhere as much as we'd like to this is a slave's home and this building actually has been torn down and rebuilt here inside the museum. In 1860, it was home to seven African-American slaves owned by Andrew Jackson Purvis. Don't know if I was related to him or not. This cabin came to the museum in 1995 when a road widening project threatened to destroy it. it. Said most slaves only had basic belongings. Objects were often worn out or used up rather than being passed down as heirlooms. Of course, this home is from the 1860s, and it looks pretty decent for, for a home of that era. And if you've done any traveling in Appalachia, this is the way people lived. And, and I'm talking about all types of people. In Salisbury, North Carolina, on March the 18th, 1863, a group of 40 to 50 soldiers' wives, desperate to feed their families, marched on Salisbury. It was called the Bread Riot, and they targeted shopkeepers who charged inflated prices. The women broke down one store door with hatchets before heading to nearby government warehouses. So this female raid netted 23 barrels of flour and quantities of molasses and salt. A barrel of flour that had sold in Raleigh for $18 in 1862 for $500 in 1865. And bacon went from $0.33 cent a pound to $7.50 a pound because of the blockades and not able to get food in. And shopkeepers raised the prices. These artifacts or items here was recovered from what is believed to be the Queen Anne's Revenge, the wreck of Blackbeard's flagship. It ran aground in Beaufort Inlet in 1718. This Blackbeard's flag. In the North Carolina Museum of History, they have an exhibit on sports in North Carolina with some of the baseball legends either from North Carolina or having some type of connection and there are a lot of them. See if there's any that you recognize or may even be related to. And there's track and field.
football. Everybody knows whose car this is. The North Carolina Motor Speedway. Richard Petty. Even the Harlem Globetrotters. Metalloric Lemon was a native of Wilmington, North Carolina. My friend Jacob the Carpetbagger once got chastised for filming in a quilt museum but here filming is encouraged here's a quilt made from silk it was known as a crazy quilt craze of 1876. Oh boy, look at all the quilts. Certain quilts became memory objects, even if their makers didn't intend for them to serve as memorial function. Sometimes the makers would die and it would cause their descendants to treat the bed covers with great reverence, full of memories. I hear a lot of people today talking about getting tattoos to help them to remember different things. But back in the day, there were memory quilts. They used the bed covers to mark life's milestones. Like for instance, this was from the dress that Sally wore at her prom. Look at this quilt. This thing hurts your eyes to even look at it. A drugstore exhibit. Circus Peanuts. And this is a early 20th century makeup counter. Hey, I want to get us a, a milkshake for Wally and the beef. It's on me. Nineteen twenty-one, July the twenty-first, Deputy Al J. Pate was killed during a raid on Williams Moonshine Steel. He was arrested and charged with murder the next day. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison at the Central Prison in Raleigh. Then he was transferred to Cary Prison Farm in Topton in Graham County, where he meets Captain H.T. Peoples. And in prison is where he started making guns, of all places, to make guns in prison. Here are his, some of his weapons that were prison made. Sixteen 
said while he was in solitary confinement, he started designing guns, of course, on paper, and that impressed the warden and put him to work in the prison blacksmith shop. When he got out of prison, he built this shop right here where he worked as an independent contractor for major arms manufacturers. Remington set women to milling machine and lathe, but he made a lot of the smaller tools. And he continued to work here until the 1970s. Well, I hope you have enjoyed our trip to the North Carolina State Museum of History. And anyway, until next time, y'all have a good day.